It's Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. Watching television, watching television. A dynamite place to be. Dynamite! Sponsored by Vandele Industries, importers and exporters of fine latex products since 1992. And now, the man who taught Frank Burns how to eat worms, here's your host, Phil Kahn. And thank you, John Meany, wherever you are. You know, actually, John, I may not know exactly where you are right this second, but if this was the late 70s or early 80s, I have a funny feeling I'd know exactly where you'd be. Probably on a baseball diamond or an ice hockey rink or maybe even a football field with the likes of me and your brother Pat Meany and Jim Carr and Larry McGurdy and, ooh, let's not forget Scott Silva. Now, I bring up our old buddy Scott's name because today I have the honor and pleasure of interviewing his little sister, stage and screen actress Leslie Silva, on Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. It had been more than 30 years since I last spoke to Leslie, and I really had a fantastic time catching up with her. Let's take a listen to my recent conversation with the little girl we knew way back when and find out what she's been up to lately. Hi, Leslie. Thanks so much for being on the show today. I am so excited. We haven't talked in maybe 30 years. This will be fun. (laughs) Exactly. It's been a long, long time. I I owe a shout out, first of all, to your brother, Scott, who connected us. Hi, Scott Silva. (laughs) Yes, hi, Scott Silva. You better be listening. I at least need a listenership of one. Now, how I know Scott, obviously, uh, first of all, you were born in Schenectady, New York, but you were primarily raised in the Saratoga Springs area, Greenfield Center, I, I believe, to be exact. And Scott and I used to play a lot of sports together. A bunch of friends and I, we used to play hockey and football and became very close friends. And you, of course, are his little sister. <laughs> I'm, I'm his little, little sister that he used to shoot hockey pucks at. <laughs> <laughs> he used to shoot hockey pucks at me, too. So we have something in common there. Well, there you go. There you go. <laughs> So tell me, during your time growing up, when and how did you catch the acting bug? Well, you know, funnily enough, I actually, before we lived in Saratoga, we lived in a place called Burnt Hills. And I remember being five years old and I did the Christmas play there. And my parents used to tell this story all the time. Um, I played the mother in this play and I was like five and I knew everybody else's lines. And I would sit there when they were talking and my lips were moving and saying their lines. And so from kind of very early on, on, my parents used to say I was born to do it just from that. Wow. Um, Yeah. From that little exchange when I was a kid, but I always did school plays and stuff like that. And then it just kind of um, exploded around 20, probably around 20 years old. Yeah, I know you went to the University of Connecticut at Stores and then eventually went to the prestigious Juilliard School for your Master of Fine Arts. Is that correct? Yeah, I went to Juilliard uh, 91 to 95. Yeah, that's where I did my graduate work and it was a very intense experience. Um, I'm not necessarily endorsing people going to school, but uh, you learn a lot, I can tell you that. Were you surprised to get in? Was it a shoe in uh, It must have been very competitive. Well, at the time, yeah, it was. Um, I believe, I think, upwards of 2,000 audition a year. Wow. And uh, from that, they pick, I think, 10 to 20, I think is the max, out of a class. Wow. Um, so, yeah, it is pretty competitive. You must have been thrilled when you heard you got accepted. I was. I mean, it was a very long time ago, of course. But, yeah, I was, uh, I was excited. And, um, you know, it, it, it has a lot of, it obviously has a pedigree or, you know, it's very well-known school. So, yes, I was excited. I could imagine. Now, you made your professional uh, stage debut in 1995 for the Shakespeare Theater production of Macbeth in Washington, D.C. Tell me about that experience. Uh, it, was, 
it was really something. I um, was playing the um, the first witch in the Scottish play, and Stacey Keach actually oh. was playing uh, the uh, title character of Macbeth. Mm-hmm. And we, um, the last night that we performed, you know, we got we got uh, that that play is has a, a history of being cursed. Mm-hmm. And we had a pretty clean run. We had one person get injured, um, but that was about it. But the last night that we performed, there was a scene where Stacy gets sliced, you know, the, somebody takes the sword and just kind of slices him across the face. And, of course, it's all stage combat. It looks really real. And they had blood packs and the whole thing. Mm-hmm. The last night we're performing the witches happened to be in this 28 foot iron tree looking over this fight that Macbeth and Macduff were having. Uh-huh. So we're looking down and that night all of a sudden Stacy grabs his face and there's a lot of blood this night. And we're going, Oh my God, what is going on Uh-oh. in the tree? You know, as the performance is going on, turns out that he got, he actually got cut in the middle of the performance, but the guy was such a pro that he kept going. Oh, man. Kept going. And with the blood streaming down his face, he just kept going. And then we found out after the show was done that he actually really did get cut. And if the guy had, the guy who cut him had been maybe a half an inch higher, he would have taken Stacy's eye out. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. That's one of my, my, my fa- I, I hate to say it, but one of my favorite theater stories because it was just so, and they just, Stacy was so great. They just stitched him up afterwards and he went home. <laughs> and that was it. See, if it had been me, that I would have insisted on closing the production for good after that. <laughs> yeah, no, well, it was the last night. So there was, you know, it was, it was closed, you know. <laughs> last night, last week of the play. So, yeah, that was that was my first uh, exactly my first professional run of it. Cool. And then I know you uh, started Sam Shepard's one act play Chicago for New York Signature Theater in 96. Uh, Tell me about that experience. I did. It was a thrill of a lifetime because I had been a uh, fan of Sam's. Obviously, any college theater student is a fan of Sam Shepard's for years. And I had worked with Joe Chaikin, who was his right-hand man um, in college, and when I graduated, Joe invited me to audition for the Signature Theater's uh, season of Sam Shepard plays, and I auditioned for one of the smaller roles, and my agent said, oh, you're going to go in for one of these smaller roles. Well, when I got to the audition, I walked in the room, and Sam goes, I started to read, and he goes, no, we wanted you for the lead. Huh. Wow. And the thing you have to understand is, you know, I'm an African-American actress, so my agents automatically put me in for the smaller role. Uh Uh-huh. But when I got there, Sam and Joe were like, no, we want you for the lead. Oh, that's great. So I ran outside, five minutes to prepare, came back in, did the audition, and found out the next day that I uh, got it. That's amazing. Now... I guess it could be considered good news or bad news when they told you they wanted you for the lead. I mean, it's quite an honor, but at the same token, like you said, you have five minutes to prepare. Yeah, I mean, I was, I didn't even, it didn't, it just was so, when when that happens, it's usually, to me, better. Because you just can't think. You just have to do, you just have to go, you just have to make a choice, you have to stick to it, go in and let your instinct take over. And I prefer it. Um, I do, I prefer it. Um you know, I think with auditioning, it can get you can get a little in your head. And I think just cold re- I I do much better just cold reading stuff. I really do. It's usually your first in- instinct that's the best, anyway. Oh, then it then it worked out for you. Then that's great. Yeah. So, and it was a thrill of a lifetime um, just to you know have that experience with him. It really was. Now I got to fast forward ahead another year beyond that. I happen to be on a date. Oh, yeah, yes, yes. Oh, I, God. I happen to be on a date, and I took her to a rom-com, and the rom-com was called Fools Rush In. And, of course, I had no idea what was about to happen. I think you know where I'm going yeah. with this. 
It was my first film. It was nothing. It was absolutely a miserable experience. It was? Oh! Well, for the listeners out there, it was a Matthew Perry, Salma Hayek movie, and I'm sitting there watching the movie, having no idea you were in it, and all of a sudden you appear on the screen. I know it was a brief uh, cameo, but I'm like, oh my God, that's Leslie Silva. <laughs> Uh, oh, it was great. Yeah, that was my, that's how I got my SAG card right there. Yeah. That movie. So why was it a bad experience? Well, I didn't, I've never been on a set before. And so when they called action, I didn't know that meant that I had to move. <laughs> <laughs> and I kept messing up. It was this big scene with these trailers and tractors and all this stuff. And so some, you know, when they yell action, they have a bunch of other actions going on at the same time. So there's action for the trailer. There's action for Matthew Perry and his person. There's action for this. There's action for that. Uh-huh. I didn't know that I was supposed to go on the big action. Oh, no. So I just kept messing up. But finally, I got, I finally, I, I, I knocked one out, and that's what made the film. And <laughs> it, wasn't the hap- it wasn't the happiest of sets anyway, so it was really something. Aww. Yeah. Here I was hoping for a cute little story, but I guess only mine is the cute side. There's nothing cute about acting, honey. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, The cutest of uh, lives. But go ahead. (laughs) Oh, no. (laughs) Here I was thinking, oh, I'll get some cute little anecdotes from Leslie, and we'll have a fun little chat, and now I'm going to hear about all the bad stuff. No, I mean, that's just... It's just the way it is. It was it was fine. It was, you know, it is what it is. So, Leslie, let's talk about your foray into television. You appeared on many shows around that era in the 90s, uh, CSI and CSI Miami, uh, your big role in Providence, Cold Case, Person of Interest, The Good Wife, Madam Secretary. Of course, I'm going through the years now. You've been on practically yeah. every show uh, on TV, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I've been fortunate enough. I, I'm one of those actors that people go, aren't you my cousin? Or how do I know you? You're my doctor. Who are you? you know, <laughs> just because I've done a lot of TV and, you know, um, was on Homicide as well, which was a thrill. That was amazing. That was really my first um, big TV role was Homicide opposite Andre Brower. You were a nun, right? Yes, yes, that was a two-part episode, and it was just, again, like I said earlier, I, I, I had never been, in, I'd only been studying theater, so TV is a whole different beast, um, and I kept missing my mark and all this kind of stuff, but they were really, really just so sweet, and it was really an extraordinary uh, experience as well, working with an Andre Brower, really cool. Yeah, he's great. Mm-hmm. Now, I know yeah, you uh, yeah, yeah. had a recurring role in Odyssey 5, which is one of my favorites, as Sarah Forbes. Uh, I know uh, ah. that show starred Peter Weller, and I was reading recently that you, you owe him a lot. He's like your uh, mentor in a lot of ways. Why don't you tell me about that experience? Well, you know, um, Odyssey 5 actually was what's called a series regular. So that means, you know, you're in every episode and... Um, he, Peter really taught me more about film acting than anybody I've ever worked with. Uh, he just, well, I mean, I would say Peter and Yafet Koto actually were my oh. two biggest teachers in terms of how to be still in front of the camera and how to do very little in order to portray what's going on in the story. And, um, you know, Peter's just kind of a genius with that. And he was always really, really, really very supportive of my uh, work uh, in a way that I never really experienced before. Like, he really thought I was a really, really uh, good film actor. And that, to me, was always shocking because I came from the theater. So I always felt like I was too big or too this or too that. But he, he really showed me how to just use uh, internal monologues and and stillness in front of the camera in order to portray, you know, what you're feeling and thinking. And um, so I learned a a lot for him. And, of course, he's just one of these Renaissance guys who can do so much. I mean, he teaches art in Italy and 
you know, we would be in a weird cemetery somewhere filming in Toronto and he would point to a gravestone and tell you what century the, you know, art form that was in, you know, the, the engraved, you know, how something's engraved at the cemetery. He would be able to identify which century it came from and just this wealth of knowledge coming out of him all the time. And so I learned a lot from being with him. And of course he also is a director and he directed us in a couple of those episodes and they were always sort of the most fun because he really cared so much about the acting. So you really got to learn from a master actor, uh, directing you Mm -hmm. and how very little you need to do in front of the camera. Um, so I just, I think he's great. And he also taught me at a stunt drive. Oh, cool. <laughs> yeah, if you're going to learn, you might as well learn from Buckaroo Banzai, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, he's, he's a great guy. He's a great guy. And funnily enough, jumping ahead, yeah. he directed, um, he, he directed an episode of Shades of Blue, uh, the series that I'm currently on. Yes. Yeah, but I, I unfortunately wasn't in the episode that he directed, but we did get a chance to catch up, and he's doing great. You know, he's doing great. He's a great, he's a great guy. Great guy. Yeah, and for those who may not recognize the name, just go check out the movie RoboCop. That's where I first there you <laughs> go. made him. He, he was, was the RoboCop. Yes, yep. he was the RoboCop. And I did see the picture of you and Ray Liotta and Peter on, I think, your Facebook page or something. So I was going to ask you, hey, how and when did you reconnect with Peter? But you just answered that question. Yeah, that's where that picture comes from. Is uh, we were, I was filming an episode and he was prepping for the next episode and we were all kind of standing outside and said, when am I ever going to be standing outside with Ray Liotta and Peter Weller again? <laughs> right. So you better, <laughs> better snap a photo quick. Yeah. We snapped a picture. It was great. They're, they're both really just fabulous actors and, and uh, been very generous with me. So I appreciate both of them. Absolutely. And uh, speaking of photographs, I know you're quite the photographer. One of I was checking out your website where you sell photos, and there's a really cool black and white photograph of Peter Weller. He's smoking a cigar, and the the smoke is yeah. wafting in the air. That was a really great shot. Yeah, yeah. He's you could photograph that face for days. <laughs> so people should go check it out. What what is the photography website so uh, the listeners can take a gander? It's lesliesilvaphotography.com. Oh, that's easy to remember. Yeah, there's some yeah. great shots on there. I really, but I, that, that one was my favorite when I was checking it out the other day. Now, oh, thank you. Yes. Now, speaking of shades of blue, you play Gail Baker, uh, the head mm-hmm. of the New York branch of the FBI. See, I hadn't even realized you had any of that kind of background. Oh, wait, that's an acting gig. Uh, never mind. Um, now, this is its third and final season. Have you wrapped shooting yet? Oh, yeah. We've been wrapped for almost, I think, seven months, I guess. Oh, it's been that seven long? Months? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Were you sad to see the show get canceled? Um, of course. I mean, you know, it's a great group of people, but I think Jennifer has a lot of things going on, so. <laughs> <laughs> no, like what? <laughs> She's got nothing else to do, does she? Right. No, I think she has uh, quite a life going on, so it was... Uh, you know, it was meant to be a short stint for her. So gotcha. three seasons is pretty great, you know. Yeah. So so tell me about working on Shades of Blue and working with Jennifer Lopez. Um, there, She's a consummate professional, incredible woman. Just uh, incredible memory, work ethic. Um, I've never met anybody like that in my life who she'll be in Vegas one night doing her thing and dancing for two hours and then up on the set of shades of blue at five o'clock completely off book ready to go that is amazing she's uh, they just don't make them like that you know there's a handful of people in the world with that wet work ethic and uh she's one of them oh that's great well i'm sorry that the uh show ended but as you said all things you know come to an end so so what's next i know and i'm sure you can't spill the beans at all but yeah, i know you had an audition today what what's next uh in line for you i've been also very active kind of um 
in social causes as of late, and I'm heavily involved in the Time's Up movement. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work from there with that. I just got back from a global conference in Ojai with that. Um, so I'm definitely doing a, there's a lot of work to be done on the planet right now besides acting. So I've been really, you know, trying to help out when and if needed uh, with these social ills that we're all experiencing. Um, in terms of acting, I, I just, uh, I wrapped a small film, a couple small films about a month ago and, um, Right now, working on writing a film with a friend of mine and uh, gathering up producing partners and all this kind of stuff. It's a yeah, that's that's what I'm doing right now. Well, that's that's noble. I have seen that you were at the Tribeca Film Festival, and I saw you with your uh, Times Up uh, T-shirt and so on. I didn't know whether you felt comfortable talking about those causes on here or whether you just wanted to kind of keep it light. But I know you're very uh, conscious about the political situation in the world, and uh, there, there are a lot of concerning things going on right now, and um, I'm proud that you're, you're involved in making your voice heard. I mean, I don't know what else to do. Otherwise, I would be just very depressed, you know, and, yeah. I, and I don't want to do that. So activism is the quickest way to kind of alleviate that um, you know, uh, angst, uh, because at least you're doing something. I did a lot of work with Howard Zinn back in the day, and he used to, and I'm paraphrasing, but he used to say that, you know, um, you fight a good fight so you can sleep at night, you know, and I'm, I'm completely paraphrasing there, and I'm, regardless of what side politically you are on, there are a lot of people suffering right now, and so I think, I'm hoping we can all agree that we want to help those who are suffering. And um, so that's, that's been, you know, a lot of my year, actually, is just really digging in and trying to uh, help create an atmosphere on set that is safe for everybody, you know. And um, there's been enormous change in the industry, and it's been for the better. I think the betterment of any project you can be on, it's better when it's a safe project. And and so um, the industry in particular, the entertainment industry, has been really working to create that. And it's not it's not a band aid. It's very real what's happening, and and women. And men are are definitely saying no to these kinds of abuses. Mm. Um, and I think uh, we're really having an effect on on uh, people. So it's it's been extraordinary to be a part of a part of it and to witness it and to see things like the Screen Actors Guild really responding to it and creating codes of conduct that will keep people safe from, for years to come, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's, it's pretty cool. It's pretty cool to be a part of it, I got to say. A absolutely. Right. So you're optimistic. You feel yeah. like it, it is making a difference in your tr and it corner yeah. is being turned? Look what's happening. I mean, these men, a lot of them were institutions under themselves. Yeah. And to see that really paying the piper or whatever you want to call it is like a Matt Lauer or a Harvey Weinstein or Bill Cosby. These men were extremely powerful and nobody can underestimate how powerful they were. Mm -hmm. And so to finally have women believed in this way has been extraordinary because there's nothing worse than having something happen to you and not being believed. That kind of makes the incident 10 times worse. I shudder to think uh, how many people didn't even bother speaking up, figuring that, you know, nobody would believe them or nobody would take them seriously or nobody would do anything about it, which is scary. Yeah. Well, I'm one of them. I mean, I, I, I don't mind telling the story because I've told it on Facebook, but I did Cosby's 
show back in 98. That's on my resume there, and it was a thrill of a lifetime. The CBS version of Class B. Yep. Yeah, I worked with my idol, and the next thing you know, he drugged me in his uh, dressing room. And uh, um, I, thank God, got out of there because I told him that my um, father played football against him in college, and for whatever reason, that just kind of stopped him from coming on to me. But, I mean, I don't remember, you know, how I got home from the set. I barely remember filming the next day. Mm. Um, and I have a friend, my roommate at the time, told me that I came home and said, I think Bill Cosby drugged me. Oh, my God. Yeah, I never said anything. I just, I just kind of, I didn't, I don't, I don't know why I didn't say anything. But I know that it was, it scared the crap out of me, you know. Sure. Um, especially when you admire someone like him for your whole life, basically, since the Jell-O commercials. Oh, everybody was, everybody loved Bill Cosby because of that. Very weird. And so, you know, one of the things that's been so incredible about Time's Up is how, you know, that was a secret for me for a very long time. I do have a witness, but it was a secret. I didn't really tell a lot of people. And, you know, there's, we have to get rid of the shame that we all feel when we have these things happen to us, because what happens is you end up kind of ingesting it as somehow your fault or something. And, and it really can create havoc on your sense of self. So I just, you know, encourage everybody to, you're as sick as your secrets, so don't be secret about stuff and just keep, you know, speaking out, speaking up, being honest. Um, it's just the best. It's just the healthiest thing for you to do, you know. Um, so, yeah, yeah. so the, that's because it had such a, an effect on me. It was when Time's Up started, I really, I, I have, I know, um, I don't want anybody else to experience that. So it kind of drives all my actions in terms of what I'm doing with it, you know. But I know you wanted to keep it light, but so there it is. No, no, I, I, I knew this was part of it, and I, I should have asked you ahead of time whether it was okay to speak about this or not or whether we should just skip it. But, um, no, I'm, I'm glad it came up. It's an important thing to, to discuss. I think so, yeah. To see... Cosby and others like him finally being held accountable, you know, has got to be very freeing in a way for you to have your situation validated in a way and your reality and have it, you know, it's got to be um, very cathartic, I guess is the word I could use. You know, it's interesting. I had the day the verdict came out, a lot of people were calling me and I just, I just was crying because it, it was, it's a mixture of relief, but then other, it's just also very sad. Sure. Um, and the whole thing is just sad. And, and why human beings treat each other the way we do sometimes, I just probably will never understand. But, uh, you know, I mean, one thing that has been wonderful about being in this movement is getting your power back. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's been really freeing and not carrying around that secret or that shame is, is you know, that's been great. Good, good for you on that one. Now, I do want to end yeah. on a high note, as we talked about, and this is a little funny thing. I didn't realize this until this past week when I was doing some research on you. As I told the listeners and you at the beginning of the interview that your brother, uh, your brother Scott and I grew up together. We played a lot of sports like hockey, and I would, I would say it's safe to assume that he and I would have both loved to have been on some kind of sports trading card. I hadn't realized you have your own trading card. You were on Star Trek Enterprise, and you have your own Star Trek card. I didn't know that. I do. I mean, I, it's the proudest moment of my life was when I was sitting down, and they send you a thousand of them, and you have to you sign them. Yeah. And then at the Star Trek Star Trek conventions, they people pay for them. I think mine goes for twelve twelve ninety five. <laughs> <laughs> I want one. I saw them on eBay for like twenty bucks. I think I'm gonna I'm gonna buy one. They're on eBay for twelve ninety five, and I played um, Danica Erickson played the daughter of the inventor of the transformer. So ah. I am a big deal in Star Trek universe. 
Yes, you are. That is so cool. Now, is uh, Scott jealous that you have your own trading card? Um, no, my brother doesn't get jealous. My brother is really very proud of his, his little sister. Aww. Well, we all are. We're all very proud of you, Leslie, and I'm so glad you oh, took thanks. the time today to be on the show. This has been great catching up with you after all these years. Excellent, Phil. I, I hope I uh, exceeded expectations. You absolutely did, Leslie. I love talking to you, and I wish you the best of luck in your continued career success. Thank you, my love. We'll talk soon. All right. Take care. All right, Phil. Bye-bye. I'd like to thank today's guest, Leslie Silva, for a wonderful stroll down memory lane. Leslie, not only have you made your brother Scott and the rest of your family extremely proud, those of us who remember the young girl from just outside Saratoga Springs are immensely proud of you as well. God bless, my friend. Watching television, watching television. We hope you've had a dynamite time listening to this edition of Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. Join us again next time for another stroll down memory lane. Until then, let's be careful out there.